Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to another SACPA session. Um, hope you're enjoying the snow. SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the land of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respects to their past, present, and future cultural heritage beliefs and relationship to the land. SACPA is very thankful for the continuing support we receive from the University of Lethbridge, Shaw Spotlight, and the Lethbridge Herald. Today, we're very happy and honored to have with us Mandy Olsgaard, uh, who will be talking about um, what does an independent case study of the Alberta Energy Regulators coal mining regulations tell us. Mandy Olsgaard is currently the owner of and senior toxicologist at Integrated Toxicology Solutions. Over the past 15 years, Mandy has worked as a toxicologist and risk assessor in research, consulting, and regulatory environments to develop coordinated and effective risk management plans for energy and non-energy resources by collaboratively addressing industry, regulatory, First Nations, Métis, and public stakeholders' concerns. I want to thank you very much, Mandy, for joining us today for this hour, and we very much look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, hi, everyone. So just uh, thank you for the introduction. Just quickly, I'll continue. So uh, after getting my Bachelor's of Science in Biology in 2001, I traveled the world a bit and completed my Master's of Toxicology at the same university, University of Saskatchewan. Um, I have been a professional biologist since 2007. Just a bit of background. So I was a toxicologist and risk assessor um, in consulting environments in Alberta. So with some of the big consulting firms. Then I moved on to the Alberta Energy Regulator where I was the senior toxicologist. So I have a pretty good handle on how we're regulating energy development and I have been an instructor uh, at the college level so uh, I focus on risk-based guideline development really undertaking risk assessments and developing management plans for identified risks heavily involved in community-based monitoring programs over the past five years and always focusing on environmental policy and regulation so moving on uh, so I just want a, a few caveats about my presentation today. The slides might look a little busy at times, but uh, this is because I've pulled these materials directly from industry reporting, regulatory publications, or government policy documents. None of these have been derived by me, but the interpretations and the conclusions are my own professional opinion. So let's dive right in, regulating coal development. Um, so the AER regulates coal mining, and this is because under the Responsible Energy Development Act, RIDA, the AER was stood up in 2013. So in standing up the AER, uh, uh, several pieces of legislation came under the mandate of the AER. The Coal Conservation Act, Environmental Protection and Enhancement Act, Mines and Minerals Act Part 8, Public Lands Act and Water Act. These all directly apply to coal exploration and development. So this is why uh, the AER is regulating coal. So moving through the AER process, um, the regulation of any energy development in Alberta, you know, is undertaken in multiple phases. So we have the project application phase. This is where we see the environmental impact assessment being developed and submitted. We'll have statements of concern that could be put forward by concerned um, stakeholders that could be directly or adversely impacted. Um, a lot happening at this stage. Then we move through compliance and project closure. So we're gonna talk about each of these phases in the energy regulation cycle uh, throughout this presentation. But quickly, I wanna talk about the one-stop system first. Uh, there's been some discussion of this in uh, the news recently. So one-stop is an automated review technology that the AER developed. And so you can see down there in the right hand side, um, <clears throat> the, the applications that would be considered under one stop that would be relevant to coal mining or explanation would be these new amended or renewal applications under the Public Lands Act, uh, under the Water Act, 
codes of practice under the Water Act or some of the reclamation applications. So it's important because uh, this automated system allows the regulator to do uh, quick reviews of what they've identified as low risk applications. And so if an application is low risk, it receives the standard or baseline review, and this is automated through the system. However, if something in the one-stop system flags that application as requiring additional or manual review, then it requires more oversight. And this, the box on the bottom left um, is, tells you a bit about why you would need more oversight. So maybe government policy, so like APIA. Most APIA applications could not be automatically approved through one-stop. Um, Okay, so a review of the one-stop application summary. I put the link down there in the bottom corner. So there is a Tableau viewer and you can pull some of the statistics around one-stop applications. So when we focus in on mines, unfortunately I can't differentiate an oil sands mine application from a coal mine, but we can see that you know the applications are by well, disposition, pipeline or water approvals. Um, so 92% of all the applications submitted through this system were approved. And, you know, it was about half and half required that additional review to baseline review. Unfortunately, this is about as much detail as we can understand. You, you, you can't really pull out why that additional review was required. But, you know, there's, there's some transparency around this system. And I think this is important for people who are trying to understand how exploration has happened on the coal mines previously and some of the, some of the work that's being uh, undertaken at those coal mining sites over the summer. Okay, so moving along, manual regulation. So if we cannot have an application reviewed through this automated process of one stop, we move into this manual regulation. And uh, yes, the AER is responsible for all of the regulation, but they really do it using Alberta's environmental assessment process. And the four stages that we're gonna talk about in depth today now are environmental assessment, public interest decision by the board, the approval with the conditions and compliance. <clears throat> so I'll discuss each of these uh, on the slides. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the case study I chose for today is the Cardinal River, River operations. Um, it's actually a bit of a tricky story to piece together. The first EIA that I could find was in 1996. Um, I'm sure many of you in the audience are very familiar with the, the life cycle of this mine and the regulatory hearings that happened there. Um, you know, there were several legal cases put forward by concerned individuals. I'm not going to discuss any of that today. I'm just going to basically start from, you know, there was these four environmental impact assessments that were submitted. Um, we have this new... Mackenzie Red Cap project that's been submitted to the AER, I cannot locate any of these documents. So I don't have a review of the EIA or the impacts that were identified. But um, this kind of is one of the issues. There's a bit of lack of transparency around some of these EIAs. Could be because they're older. Alberta Environment does provide a link to EIAs. Um, so this, I'm not really too sure why I couldn't track them down. So I have really heavily relied Moving through to the next slide here, I really heavily relied on the public interest decisions by the board. And so the Cardinal River Coal, so oh, originally there was a decision in 1997 by the EUB, the predecessor of the AER. Uh, you know, there was a lot of stakeholder feedback on this decision. They thought several issues hadn't been adequately considered. So we had a joint review panel established in which the federal government participated in the review. Uh, at the end of both of these processes, and these are large documents that have, you know, several issues flagged or considerations. Uh, but overall, they determined that the Cheviot project site um, is not economically feasible to conduct it as an underground mine, and they approve the mine for open pit mining operations. So moving through to the approval with the conditions, so there's been several iterations of the APIA approval. 
um, issued. The most recent is this November 2010 with an expiry in 2020. So Cardinal River, certain mine pits are moving into the reclamation stage. Again, a bit more of the complexity of this story. But So I'm really going to focus on the APIA approval clauses. Um, these are our backstop, right? So if there were issues identified in the environmental impact assessment process, the APIA approval clauses are where we try and monitor and understand if those predicted impacts Impact, predicted risks or impacts became measured on the landscape. And we do this through the compliance component. So the examples I'm going to give today are from the Cardinal River Operations 2019 annual report, which was submitted in 2020. Uh, and I'm going to pull information out of some of these appendices. Okay, so let's move through this case study. Um, I just have to note here that all of the information I'm presenting today, because it is under EPIA approvals, is not publicly available through a self-serve option at the AER. You have to request it. And so I provided that information there. This uh, information request email is one of my favorites. I talk to the experts over there a lot at the AER. And, you know, they are very helpful. They'll get you the information you need. But sometimes it's a bit of a long process to go through. Okay. Let's talk about selenium first. We, we know that these EIAs identify potential uh, impacts to the environment from selenium contamination. I'm not going to go into, uh, you know, the example of the tech mine, the Elk Valley tech mines in too much detail, but we did see, you know, one of the largest ever fines under the Fisheries Act recently submitted for uh, deposition of deleterious substances from that those mines. So, we know that this is a potential risk. Uh, so you can see on the very top there, here's the decision statement from the board. And the panel concluded that selenium levels in the aquatic environment, um, while warranting ongoing monitoring and research, do not currently represent a significant risk of adverse effects on regional water quality. And this might be too, true. Um, they don't, however, say anything about the local impacts. So, you know, following that through those next two um, figures, you can see the APIA approval clause. So because of this finding by the panel and the predicted impacts, um, they are required to monitor and manage selenium. And we have objectives that we have to meet for selenium off-site in the upper McLeod system. This is one of the examples I've chosen. There's several different uh, systems they have to monitor selenium in around these uh, mines, but we, we would be here much longer if I pulled all that out. So let's move on to the selenium report. You can see the reference up there. So this was submitted in March 2020. This table is for the upper McLeod system, as I said. So when we compare the reported um, measurements and the trends uh, against the objectives, you can see they range from 0.3 to 0.9 and with the target of improving median and 90th percentile concentrations. So, you know, again, I think a water quality specialist, an aquatic biologist or a fisheries biologist, we could spend months trying to understand this data, if not years. I'm just going to really take it from a compliance, non-compliance perspective. And what do we see? Well, it was simpler to flag compliances. So anywhere you can see the green highlighting, these are the measured concentrations in the upper McLeod system that are below the targets identified in the APIA approval. So the non-highlighted are above. If we move down to the trends, we see the majority of trends are still increasing in the system with the exception of MR6. So again, my interpretation, I would say that this mine is not completely in compliance with their APIA approval conditions. If we continue moving through, uh, you know, we can do a quick comparison to the Alberta uh, guidelines for selenium. So, you know, two micrograms per liter is the guideline. One microgram per liter is our alert concentration. You can see in the table down here, these are these concentrations are directly linked to impacts in the environment and protection of bioaccumulation of selenium in the food web and for fish, fish reproduction and health. So again, when we look 
The highlighted yellow are exceedances of guidelines that have been measured. I use the 50th percentile and the average. The guidelines for Alberta require you to use the average. Uh, you can also see in blue where we're exceeding the alert concentrations. So consistently during early years and continuing to date, there are exceedances of the Alberta guidelines and the alert concentrations. And in the report, um, you know, tech acknowledges that these increases are from discharges from their mining operations and they commit to continue to monitor these. So we've seen these, you know, for over a decade, really, these increasing continual exceedances. Uh, also point out, you know, there's been some risk and management discussions. They did an ecological risk assessment. Um, yeah, usually we do risk assessments to try and identify potential risks to inform monitoring or management. Uh, it seems in this case they're using risk assessment as a tool to continually evaluate the potential risk, even though there's measured concentrations that are indicating risk in the environment. And, you know, I just provide a bit of context there from the framework for ecological risk assessment from the US EPA. We don't have a guidance in Alberta, we do in Canada. I couldn't couldn't find a nice statement though. Uh, so, you know, risk assessments are not a solution for addressing all environmental problems, nor are they always a prerequisite for environmental management. Many environmental matters, such as the protection of habitats and endangered species are compelling enough that there may not be enough time or data to do a risk assessment. And so there should be professional judgment executed in these cases. And I would take that to say, you know, if you're seeing measured impacts in these water bodies offsite, there should be management action. And, you know, this is why I have the Fisheries Act there. I think there could be, you know, non-compliances and potential deposition of deleterious substances. So, you know, that's a, a, the first example of how we piece together that original decision that was made the APIA approval clause to ensure compliance, and then we have our monitoring, right? So I would say this example is showing, uh, you know, maybe not great compliance. Um, and then we'll talk in a little bit about enforcement actions. So there, I couldn't find any specific enforcement actions uh, around this specific example. Okay, so Harlequin Ducks. Uh, Again, in that joint panel conver in that joint panel decision, you know, adverse effects on harlequin ducks were identified. There was some proposed mitigation, um, and the panel felt that the proposed mitigation would uh, decrease these adverse effects and render them insignificant. I think that's important because when we talk about significance, you know, we're talking about the scientific principle that you would see, you know, that probability less than 0 0.05 for significant and anything above could be insignificant. So I guess we would assume that we would see compliance and enforcement that would uh, include uh, assessment of significance. So uh, on the right hand side there, you can see the Harlequin Duck Management APIA Approval Clause. Uh, they, knew, they do need to have a management program. I couldn't locate this, so I don't know what any of the specific measures or criteria are. Um, but when we move on to the compliance component, so we have the Harlequin Duck study that was um, submitted by Tech using a consulting firm. And we look at the population trends of these harlequin ducks. I'm only showing females here, but I do give you the exact reference. So you can go pull the information from the males and dig in yourselves. And, you know, we see that in the early pre-mining or uh, baseline development phase, uh, there was no significant decreasing trend. Uh, when we moved into the operating phase, we do see a significant decline over the 24 year period. And I thought that this was an important example because they actually show significance here, uh, which to me means, you know, they're significantly um, affecting uh, like a population of ducks or the receptor that was um, assessed in the environmental impact assessment. So I would be expecting to see some uh, enforcement actions around this non-compliance. Uh, just another example I'll show, so the brood survey, so this was for ducklings, um, you know, in early mining, it looked like maybe there was uh, some decreases in the broods, uh, but then 
so this was insignificant at pre-mining, but it became significant in that early mining operating phase. So just another example of the importance of really interpreting your data and, uh, you know, really comparing it to the original predictions in your environmental impact assessments. Uh, another big concern was grizzly bear populations and how the mining would affect the grizzly bears. Um, so there was a... Uh, uh, this work, this early work, the grizzly bear conservation in the yellowhead ecosystem, a strategic framework. So the panel felt if the project proponents were, um, you know, aligning with this framework and considering it, that they would be able to manage any adverse impacts on the grizzly bear populations. So again, we see an APIA clause where they have to participate in a management program and they have to report on it annually. Uh, so it was it was interesting to see there was multiple reports submitted for the grizzly bear uh, potential impacts. So there was, um, you know, the same consulting firm had done wildlife surveys where they just give uh, observations. But then there was a, a really good report on the relationship between natural resource extraction footprints and the distribution abundance of grizzly bears in Alberta. And this has been a research initiative for multiple academics, maybe not specific to coal mining, but it was a pretty robust piece of information that really shows how development is impacting grizzly bears. And again, not a wildlife biologist, not a specialist in grizzly bears. But when I looked at this, I was, you know, it looks like they have really put a lot of effort into this and maybe um, the panel's understanding of how monitoring and management could um, you know ensure that grizzly bears were protected I do feel like this was a very they were compliant here I feel like you know the information was showing that you know grizzly bears don't seem to be impacted but again not a wildlife biologist um, the one thing I thought was really interesting when I looked at these wildlife surveys, I found, um, you know, the the panel said that they were concerned about adverse impacts on the traditional use of lands by Aboriginal people. Uh, they thought it was unlikely that the project would adversely affect the health or the resources. Um, when I looked into the APIA approval, I could not find any clauses that that had the terms Aboriginal, Indigenous rights, traditional health or human health. So there's no actual compliance monitoring required. But when we look at the results from those same reports, we see that, you know, ptarmigan, snowshoe hare, elk, the deer, the sheep, these species are quite often seen on these mine sites. They're observed there, but there's no uh, monitoring requirement for um, the tissues that are used as traditional foods by Indigenous people. So this is really, we don't have any understanding about whether there are potential impacts to health from people consuming traditional foods. Um, as I stated before, so within the report, I couldn't find any um, compliance or enforcement decisions by the AER. They, when an industry proponent submits their annual reporting under their APIA clauses, there is no AER published document that says we have reviewed and these are the compliance actions or the enforcement actions that are required. Um, you can look on the compliance dashboard and you can see for Cardinal River Coals, there have been some uh, enforcement actions against them. You know, this section is supposed to include any administrative sanctions or enforcement decisions. So uh, a bit of a back big black box here. We don't know what the AAR did with the 2019 reports that I presented here that I think give, uh, you know, some examples of non-compliances. Uh, I just quickly want to touch on regulating liability, noting we're kind of running out of time here. So again, this is directly from... Uh, presentations by the AER where they have identified that the potential liability in Alberta and liability meaning um, environmental contamination that will require remediation or reclamation you know from each of the energy sectors uh, 260 billion dollars uh, important to recognize that the oil and gas and in situ and in pipelines are managed through the liability management rating system uh, and mining is managed a bit differently. So just want to flag here, you know, they're holding about 216 million in securities. Uh, you know, they're saying there's about 29 billion, you know, uh, potential liability on the landscape. So again, when we're looking at how they regulate liability, 
they're just not holding enough funds to ensure that those companies, uh, you know, if those companies walked away, that they would be able to clean up the liability left behind. Uh, moving on to the mining sector. So this is where coal mines and oil sands mines would come in. Uh, you can differentiate the monies held for coal mine reclamation from oil sands. Um, I thought this was pretty interesting because you can see, and I did create this graph from this table. So you can see that the liability in the province for mining has been slowly increasing. The securities that are held uh, you know, has not been increasing. You know, we hold about 4.7% security for the identified liability. I also really wanted to point out here the example that, um, so economics drive many of the regulatory decisions that are made. And the, you know, in May 2021, the government came out and said, you know, due to drastic changes in oil prices, this affected the calculation and the amount of security that we would have to get from companies. Therefore, we're going to change the calculation. So this shows that, you know, our regulatory system is tied to the economics of oil and gas, and there are external pressures on this system, right? We're not, we're holding less than 5% in securities already. Now we know that the price of oil can affect that to even lower. Um, and again, you know, world-class, from the presentation by Mr. Wadsworth from the Alberta Energy Regular in 2018, you know, what New Mexico and Texas have some better, you know, liability and reclamation best practices as compared to Alberta. I haven't seen anything updated. I do realize it's 2021. So, you know, with a grain of salt, but this is from a presentation from our own regulator saying that we uh, maybe aren't, you know, best in class or best in the world. So my conclusions, um, you know, maybe it didn't come out in the presentation, but I think I gave some pretty strong examples of non-compliances when you move through the regulatory system. So you have a decision that states there could be impacts. You have an APIA approval that is there to, ma to maybe monitor those impacts. And then you have a compliance system to enforce the management. Uh, and I showed examples where it's not being enforced. Um, I think these are systemic issues from economic pressures on the Alberta regulatory system. And I say economic pressures because I worked for the Alberta Energy Regulator under an NDP government, and it was no different than what we see under the UCP government. So my views are, you know, apolitical. It doesn't matter what system you have running Alberta, the economic pressures from industry or uh, the reliance on royalties, that's what's driving it. And that's independent of government sometimes. Uh, this will affect the decisions that are made, you know, by the board, the clauses that go into the approval, the compliance and the enforcement decisions right through the, you know, the entire regulation process. Um, how could we maybe start to address this? Yeah, maybe we could see quantitative benefit liability analysis being provided when there's a decision so that people can see very clearly and decide for themselves, was this a decision that was made because the economic factors outweighed the environmental factors or was it you know, a pretty even balanced decision? I think this would help a lot with the public's trust of the system and uh, really to move forward with energy development in this province. Um, these need to be predictive and forward looking. We can't continue making short term decisions. I think that's how we ran into this issue with high liability not enough security and a mistrust of the system. So again, while this might be the, maybe the cost of doing business and I'm not an economist and I can't say whether, you know, the risks outweigh the liabilities or, or the benefits outweigh the liabilities or vice versa, I can say that, you know, it's not an entirely world-class system as we're hearing touted by the government. Uh, it's not entirely risk-based and it's not a balanced approach. So with that, I think I'll, uh, I'll conclude and happy to take any questions. There's my contact information. I am happy to talk regulations any day and how you make these decisions and open to any information people provide. And thank you again. Well, thank you very much. Um, boy, that packed in a lot in a half hour. Uh, it's interesting <laughs> how you took a case study of a particular mine and walked us through it. It was very good. Um, we have quite a few questions in the chat already. So I will just start right away with our first question, which comes from Trevor Page. 
since the AER is funded by industry, how can it be independent? Any chance of an independent regulator emerging? Yeah, so I, I would say it's not independent of economic decisions that benefit this province. And we know that there's lobbying by industry. You know, you could FOIP emails to any senior executive at the AER and you'll see how often industry executives come knocking on the door to have discussions. So I can say that with confidence. Um, I don't know how we would move towards an independent body in this province. I, I really, I can't uh, project that, but I can say, you know, there's some real big issues with uh, lobbying and how decisions are made. I should say, though, I just want to caveat that I do feel like these issues are quite focused on upper management within the regulator, within industry and within the government. I feel the subject matter experts and the scientists working at the lower levels, their decisions aren't as affected by this economic pressure. It's how their decisions funnel out of the government or the regulator. They kind of get stopped at that upper management level. So I think if you could ever get talking to a subject matter expert or one of the scientists, you probably hear the same things I'm saying, but those uh, that communication doesn't come out from the regulator very often. That must be frustrating for those scientists working, working there. <laughs> hey, well, I don't work there anymore, so. <laughs> By choice, I should mention too, by choice. Our next question comes from uh, Knut Peterson. Politicians and industry people continue to highlight Alberta's world-class um, regulations. How would you rate the enforcement of such? Uh, yeah, so I provided examples directly from the regulator's own presentations. I think with respect to liability and the securities we hold and the amount of liability that's accumulated, if we interpret liability as uh, contamination requiring remediation and reclamation, I think you can easily see that those, you know, the decisions that we make to allow development on the back end are just, you know, it's uncontrolled liability and we're not seeing those long term risks for the short-term economic benefits um yeah it's it's a tricky one <laughs> i'm not sure our next question is from ian hurdle what is the current test method for selenium sample the cost and turnaround time for result oh i would have i would be speaking out of place here i'm not too sure what uh, I don't know specifically for this report because I don't know what lab they're using. Um, I didn't look into the actual lab reports in the back of the selenium report. So, you know, I'm happy to look into that and email you the information, but I couldn't answer it off the top of my head right now. I'm sorry, I missed Knut, Knut Peterson's third part to the question. So what I'm gonna do is read his whole three-part question out because I, I happened to miss and I apologize for that, Knud. Um, so I'll start right at the top again. Politicians and industry people continue to highlight Alberta's world-class regulations. How would you rate and enforce, how, how would you rate the enforcement of such? And as I understand it, AER does not have the manpower to do enforcements even if they want to. Um, again, I think that those field office staff are very hardworking. They do what they can. Uh, I, agree. I, I do think that there's much more enforcement needed. If you, if you could review the reports in the level of detail that some experts like myself and others have, if you could spend that time, I think there'd be a lot, of, lot more enforcement actions, actions from non-compliances. Um, so whether we're, you know, the world-class issue is a bit tricky. So you have the regulatory system, which, you know, I've described here, but I haven't really described the policy system. And that's where guidelines or criteria for the environmental protection, so the surface water or the air quality guidelines are defined. And I think... When Alberta is saying that we have a world-class system, you need to dig into both. You know, the regulatory system, I think I just showed, is quite 
it's quite heavily impacted by economic factors. I didn't really show uh, guidelines and how they compare to guidelines across the world. And, you know, with respect to selenium, you know, our irrigation guideline is higher than the, what's acceptable in BC for particulate matter and the air, some air quality contaminants from coal mines. You know, we, we manage them differently in Alberta and our guidelines are much higher or not even comparable to the World Health Organization. So I think when you put together our policy and our regulatory system, you know, I, I wouldn't say we're world class when we compare ourselves to the US EPA or the World Health Organization. We may be world class when we're comparing ourselves to countries that, you know, are still struggling with maybe socioeconomic factors and they're not, you know, the the people and their um, social issues are still heavily outweighing environmental protection. And that's a much different system to compare yourself to. But across the board for, you know, what I would say are comparable you know, countries or systems. No, I, I don't think we're always world class. I hope that answers that a bit better. Okay. Um, our next question comes from Jim Miller regarding AER conclusion that s and selenium will not have a detrimental effect on regional water quality. Why did they use regional spatial scale and why? Does regional mean watershed scale? Uh, this would be me interpreting that. And I think because the EUB at the time, so the joint review panel, so the EUB and the federal government, they couldn't put a statement in there saying there wouldn't be local impacts because the EIA showed there would. Uh, it was acknowledged there would be, you know, local impacts from the selenium, from the mitigation that was proposed. But uh, when they did the modeling on the regional scale, there wouldn't be broader impacts to regional uh, systems. Uh, but I think you bring up a really good point. Um, should our prefer performance system be based on regional impacts, sub-regional, local? We know that some of these species at risk are present on the local and sub-regional scale. So I would say that should be the spatial scale that we are assessing performance at. And uh, to, to be perfectly honest, I think the regional scale is a cop-out for the province and industry. And that's how they get a lot of these projects approved. Our next question comes from Terry Shillington. Is there a country in the world with an effective regula regulation system and environmental protection? So I wouldn't say a country, but I would say that the European Union is doing maybe one of the best jobs at it. They, you know, it's broader, it's over multiple countries. I, I won't say there hasn't been historical or legacy contamination, but I think, yeah, the European Union and the World Health Organization together are moving towards a better management system where they're considering, you know, health impact assessment, health risk assessment, ecological risk assessment. They're taking that one health approach where they look at the holistic ecosystem rather than single components. And I, ho I hope we're moving that way, but you know, it, it is in its infancy, sadly. I don't think the science is in its infancy, but I think the regulatory systems and policy systems are. Our next question comes from Leona Jacobs. Based on a personal attempt, my impression is that the regular citizen citizens are not considered in an AER decision. Is that true? If not true, then how can regular citizens contribute to the process? Well, I'll answer the second part first. So if you are a public member or a stakeholder that could be directly or adversely affected, you have the option of filing statements of concern on any application. First, you need to be aware of that application. You have to be notified. Uh, the AER has a public notice of application and decision, uh, external facing portal. I recommend anyone look there and try to figure out if a project is in close proximity to you or if you feel you're being adversely or directly impacted. Then file a statement of concern. That gets your voice on the record. Uh, whether they um, consider that meaningfully and start to engage you in the process, or whether they make a decision not to engage you, that is at their discretion, but at least you've stated your concern. Um, I think when these decisions are made, they're made broadly in the interest of Albertans provincially. They don't look at local scale populations the same. So 
Um, local scale impacts can be mitigated. Look at the oil sands and some of the communities, well acknowledged, uh, you know, irreversible, long-term chronic impacts to health, Aboriginal rights. These are acknowledged. Uh, on the broader scale, provincially, uh, these projects are in the economic benefit of all Albertans. So that's how they make these decisions. When you say that, it makes me think of Jessica Ernst. We had her, <laughs> we had her here at SACPA quite a, a couple of times. Yeah. Um, Andy Atmansky, isn't the coal mining sector at 100% coverage under the MFSP? Yep, I would say that the liability that's been estimated by the AAR or submitted by coal companies is covered in securities held. Um, whether that liability that's been estimated is accurate, I think, is maybe one of the major issues. But I think you are correct. From what I could see, looks like uh, a much higher percentage of coal mine securities would be held. Unfortunately, the way the AAR reports, that's not always uh, easy to tease out. But yeah, I would agree. We have a comment here from Ian Hurdle, and um, I don't know if you've read this article, so I'm not sure if you can connect to it, but a recent letter to the Lethbridge Herald about a master's project on selenium on mountain sheep noted negative effects. So it's just a comment. I don't know if you were familiar with that article. Yeah, yep, I am. And I, I pulled that master's thesis. It wasn't, uh, there. there's no publication to go with the master's thesis. You'd have to look at the actual document by Def, uh, Jeff Needman. I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name right. So when I looked at that, just at the highest level, he did measure blood levels of selenium and use those, uh, use those levels to understand safe operating zones from very much an ecological perspective but it, it didn't have the health risk context so whether the measured concentrations of selenium in the blood of those sheep would be over what we would call a safe level in the blood where we know potential impacts would happen or you would see those adverse effects so uh, i haven't done the analysis myself i did think that maybe um there were some pretty big claims made, but I, and I, I'm not too sure if the research supports the adverse health or the impacts to the population. I'd have to dig in a bit more, but I think there was a bit of, a bit of a missing piece of that puzzle, but it was interesting research nonetheless. Our next question comes from Jim Miller. Does the AER require that a toxicologist or environmental scientist be a member of their board? How are their board members chosen or are they appointed? Yeah, that is a good question. I've never known of a toxicologist to sit on the board. There may be environmental scientists. I would have to look into the background of each of the board members. But the board is quite separate of the operations of the AER. Um, I believe that I, yeah, I, I'm not too sure. I can't say how people are either appointed or applied to the board. Uh, the CEO would be, you know, my highest level of understanding. Okay. Sorry. So there's a follow-up question from Jim Miller, which I'll ask now just because it's related. Does AER have an Indigenous representative on their board? I don't know who's on the board right now. I know that there's um, a stakeholder engagement group that does have a specific set of experts and uh, you know staff dedicated to Indigenous engagement on projects. That, again, is at the operational level. I don't know if it's at the board level. OK, our next question comes from Bev Mundell. You mentioned that Aboriginal issues do not appear specifically. Have you given this talk information to an Aboriginal group? Uh, so this is the first time I've given this talk. I developed it specifically for this. Um, my, my clientele through my consulting firm are almost exclusively First Nation and Métis communities. So I do give presentations often. Um, I, I'll just add a bit to that. So we don't see clauses specifically around human health, Aboriginal rights, uh, in APIA approvals, because there's no health legislation, human health legislation, that's under the mandate of the AER. That is Alberta Health, and that is Health Canada. 
And so you would almost need a separate approval to make sure that you were monitoring and managing risks to human populations. The only way that the only mechanism we use right now through the AER is through uh, environmental resources that humans would rely on surface water for drinking water, traditional foods for consumption. But like I showed, I have not seen in a PIA approval clause where they're required to monitor tissue residue levels for a traditional food and compare them to safe consumption levels. Uh, we had many discussions on this with regulators and indigenous communities and have had no success in getting it built into an APIA approval. So there's no compliance and enforcement. Many industry proponents will do this under their social license to operate or in fact impact benefit agreements with communities. But it's generally, um, it's, it, again, it's not in the regulatory system. It's through alternate processes with industry and communities. Leona Jacobs, you are currently doing some work for the LLG, correct? And if so, will, will you be contributing to the technical slash science piece currently in process with the coal consultation committee? Uh, so I'm actually doing an independent research study for the Pakisco group. So the LLG is working with a number of great researchers and the LCs group to do a water quality and quantity modeling study. I'm going to, I'm actually doing an air quality study. So the cumulative impacts from eight of the proposed mines to air quality with a human and environmental health risk assessment. So a bit of an independent study uh, we'll be relying on and working with some of the LLG scientists, but it will, it will be independent. Um, and uh, yeah, I, once I'm done, I guess it's, it's with the Pakisco group and hopefully we'll be engaged to speak to it. It would be the first cumulative predictive air quality study uh, to show, you know, what could happen with air contamination from mine sources. So yeah, I, I hope we'll be engaged. Excellent. Um, our next question comes from Laura Schultz. How does the AER review cost? Sorry, it jumped. I'll start again. Laura Schultz. How does the AER review coal dust particle, particulates and wind factor in applications and monitor same? Do you want me to read that again? I think I botched that up. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I think I got it. Um, yeah, so pretty broad question. And I will say uh, the regulator does very little monitoring on their own of air quality impacts. The provincial government under regional plans would do that monitoring uh, with the exception of the oil sands where the oil sands monitoring program does that. Uh, it's a bit complex. So the monitoring story is complex. Um, the regulator would review any assessment or air quality monitoring report submitted by a proponent. I think this is an important distinction. So if you want to develop a project in Alberta, as the proponent or the industry partner, you do your own air quality assessment, and then you submit that to the regulator, where an air quality specialist will review that. And there is no independent assessment by the regulator. There is no cumulative environmental management system that this air quality study and predicted impacts is uploaded to to tell you if you know those cumulative impacts from that proposed development would you know put you over a management threshold or trigger that is all done by the proponent and the review is by that subject matter expert this then informs the decision that is ultimately made uh, again so air quality is kind of my specialty uh, it's one area I focus on and you know so while I think you know within the AER those subject matter experts have a lot of responsibility for reviewing those. But there's not a lot of air quality experts within the regulator. They do what they can. You know, we're really we're um, at the mercy of what that industry proponent says in those assessments, and that's why that independent review, that extra set of eyes, uh, experts not working for industry or the regulator, are so important in this process. And unfortunately, that that lies on the stakeholders to bring independent experts to find funding to get other people to review those studies and say, "Hey, you you applied the you know the wrong guideline, or you applied a less stringent guideline, or you didn't consider this source, or." You know, you didn't use this type of wind. You know, those are the types of discussions we want to have. I think the decisions make it very clear 
how the panel, uh, you know, considers that information. Th that's why we have those decision statements. So it's, it's a bit complex. I know that answer got a bit long, but I just, I don't think it's simple. I think it's really, there's a lot of experts involved and then the ultimate decision is made by the board and then the AER has to ex execute an APIA approval to try and, uh, yeah, ensure compliance. Our next question comes from Jim Byrne. Colleagues advise water quality data collected from Hinton area mines show selenium above irrigation quality guidelines. How big of a concern is this for Southern Alberta's large irrigation industry? Yeah, I couldn't speak to that without reviewing the data. I'd be happy to review it if uh, that's something you'd be interested in. in. In preparing this presentation, you know, I identified several selenium reports from the government from 1986 to I think as recent as 2010. There's been some independent research released uh, and monitoring data released by an ex-AEP scientist. Um, I think there's a lot more to be done with the selenium story from the existing mines and understanding, you know, those impacts and getting some actual management and then informing mitigation for future mining, right? We're seeing all this data coming out and we have a government telling us, you know, we have world-class regulations. We have the best mitigation and management. And I'm not saying that the, the technical advancements aren't there. I'm not saying that we can't treat selenium. I'm saying whether there would be the political will to ensure that you prevented contamination, that's where I think the effort needs to go. Um, our next question comes from Andy Admanski. Did the Grassi air quality assessment review the same air qu quality issues and will you be using this report as background? Yeah, I can't speak to the I can't speak to the study too much just because we don't have the report released and I don't have the funders here. Uh, but I think we will be uh, presenting those results. I won't be doing a specific review of the grassy, but as the only mine application that was available in that area, it you know it did heavily help me uh, develop my model and predict it. And I will say, you know when gaps were identified or limitations were identified, you know, that's the beauty of independent research. I can make those independent decisions to try and find different data sources. And I don't maybe have someone over my shoulder saying, ah, oh, just, just do it how everyone else did it. So. Knut Peterson, how would you describe the general culture slash attitude within the AAR employees working on the ground? So again, I left in 2017. I don't know if there's been a big change. Um, you know, when I worked there, we we really enjoyed working together. The projects were challenging. We had a lot of good scientific discussions. The work was always engaging. Um, it was just a constant frustration to try and, uh, you know, affect a decision that you felt would actually mitigate or manage the environmental impacts that we were seeing. It was just really hard. And I think a lot of people were frustrated by that. There was a lot of staff turnover. A lot of good experts were let go because of funding and economics. And yeah, I think there was a lot of struggles, but the work is always engaging. And those experts really are trying to do their best in a system that is very siloed and uh, that has a lot of external pressures. Uh, Terry Shillington, is it fair to say that while working for the AER, you've, your values did not match well with the AER? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's it, it, When people ask me why I left, I do say it was probably an issue with core values. And, you know, really, as a professional biologist, being able to make decisions that I think aligned with my code of conduct and doing what I thought was required as a scientist, there was the odd example. I was very lucky that my direct senior leader, the chief environmental scientist, um, I think held many of the same core values as I did. And, you know, I had a lot of top cover there, but, you know, after, after she left, it was quite difficult. And yeah, I would say that's why I left. Next question comes from uh, Trevor Page. You indicated that you didn't see any differences in the oversight of AER when the NDP government was in power. Can you elaborate? Um, so again, 
I it was a challenge to try and release reports or research or um, affect internal discussions to ensure that environmental performance was considered. This was a new concept within the AER, right? The ERCB did not have to make decisions for environmental performance. That was under the purview of the provincial government and the Alberta Environment and Parks or whatever previous names, ESRD. So we were trying to develop the systems to ensure environmental performance were considered under a PIA and the Water Act and that new legislation. Um, so I think a lot of our struggles were internal, trying to develop the systems for environmental performance. Um, maybe we had direction from the government to try and do that. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I was only successful in releasing a single report that actually considered human health and environmental risk while I was there. Our next question comes from Knut Peterson. Are you aware of any proven remedy to remove selenium from coal mining spill water? Yeah, I'm not a water quality treatment expert, and I'm, I'm just not going to speak to that. From the information I reviewed from the Tech Elk Valley operations, the water quality management plan that was put forward in 2015, you know, some of the high level information I've seen and as a toxicologist looking at that risk and the toxicity and produced effluents or the options available to manage and mitigate any release. I think those technologies are available. Uh, treating that water once it's in the environment is a very different complex issue. I think technology and environment engineered controls are there to prevent releases. I think they are very costly. I think open pit mining is chosen for a reason. It is a lot more economically uh, beneficial to industry than doing underground mining. And so we make a lot of decisions around the economics when we approve these projects. So I don't know why we would think we would make decisions any differently when we're identifying the mitigation or the engineering controls that would be required. But again, I haven't done that deep dive and I would suggest that question, maybe like a treatment engineer speak to that. Our next question comes from Leona Jacobs. My impression is that the NDP were on the cusp of reforming the AER, but lost government before they could act. What would you hope for in terms of reform of the AER to make it better? I think a truly balanced system where you had maybe risk-based criteria and performance evaluation systems that had just as many environmental indicators in it as it did economic indicators. So really, if they could come up with that balanced system where you had quantitative assessments of you know, benefits and risk, why the regulator is even considering economic benefits, I don't know. I would have thought that would be done you know, by other bodies, Department of Energy or such, but you know, there's no way it's going to happen without um, uh, leadership and a strong, you know, strong direction from the government that environmental protection under environmental legislation in Alberta becomes a priority within the regulator. Because right now, the energy enactments, the Oil Sands Conservation Act, Oil and Gas Conservation Act, these take precedence and those don't include environmental protections. That's where the specified enactments need to be informing the systems that the AER is built on. And they haven't achieved that yet. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, that was all our questions. Um, I wonder if before we end the live stream, you could give us a take home message for our viewers, please. Be loud. Honestly, I think, uh, you know, stakeholders' voices are very powerful right now. And uh, I think, you know, I gave you examples of where maybe your voices don't impact what happens after a project is approved. So be loud now, get your concerns on the record, do independent research, submit it to the government, publish it, get it out there so that people can rely on it. And when there's claims made, there's information available to either refute those or, you know, actually have information available to reform these systems, not just theoretical, right? So we know where we're moving and we have actual information to, you know, help, help better this system.
Wonderful. Thank you. We have lots of thank yous in the queue. Let me just read some of them out to you. Uh, Laurie Shields, Mandy, thank you for your objective yet sobering presentation this morning. Jim Miller, thank you, Mandy, for a very interesting talk and for answering questions so honestly and directly. And then Leona Jacobs, Beth Mandel, Knud Peterson, <laughs> Belinda, Str uh, Belinda Cosen, thank you very much. So lots of people really enjoyed this presentation. On behalf of SACPA, thank you for joining us today and for our viewers. Um, we hope you join us again next week. Thank you for joining us today. Um, our, uh, next week we have our severe funding cuts to UVL and Lethbridge College likely to have both short and long term consequences for the Lethbridge econ uh, economy with Cindy Foss from the, uh, the CEO from the Lethbridge Chamber of Commerce. That's next Thursday, same time, 10 a.m. Um, hope to see you then, folks. And that's it. Thank you. Okay.